So yes guys, we will talk about a very interesting standard that is India S23. India S23 broadly deals with something called as borrowing cost. Now the first thing which I get in my mind when I talk about borrowing cost is the cost which is affiliated to a borrowing or incidental to borrowing that is interest. However, the scope of the standard goes much beyond just an interest and why are we even specifically talking about borrowing cost? Borrowing cost is also an expense. Why don't you charge off the expense feature to p and This is what the standard is talking about or prescribing because there is a particular accounting treatment which India S23 has actually proposed for a particular kind of assets. Now let's see what borrowing cost is talking about. Borrowing cost for a definition says that it includes number one effective interest rate we'll have to discuss about this also includes finance charges under finance lease also includes exchange losses to the extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. Now there's an in-depth understanding of each particular part of the standard definition. Let's see what it actually talks about. I'm starting with the first one. What is this effective interest rate? When I use this term effective interest rate, this effective interest rate, it encompasses or includes multiple items, interest, can include processing charges also includes discount on issue of debentures or premium on redemption of debentures This is what an effective interest rate actually includes. So when we took up, uh, talk about effective interest rate, we are trying to include the interest and the processing charges, also the amount of discount on issue and premium on redemption of your debentures and bonds. Both put together, I can put across and I will say that it is effective interest rate. How do I identify this effective interest rate? The identification is very simple. All we have to do is, this is an IRR calculation which is required. How do I apply this IRR? To apply this IRR, basically we are start looking at a different perspective. What we are trying to say is, the incidental cash flows from borrowings If I discount it to present value, discount it to present value should be exactly equal to zero. Then I will say that that is a rate of effective interest. Now we will understand with the help of an example, just for park it aside, I will talk about the example later on. Then what is this finance charges? Let me get up to the next part that is finance charges under finance lease. This finance charges under finance lease is basically dealt under a separate standard in day 17 which talks about leases. So I'm parking it aside, I'll talk about this. The last part that is exchange differences or exchange losses to the extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost, this has to be understood as 
in reference to indias 21 so further more explanation is required under each case we will have to understand how this effective interest has been identified how do we talk, talk about your, your exchange differences but finance charges i will discuss only when i'm talking about finance leases under india 17 i'm packing this concept but i'll deal with the first and the last part with the help of some examples that is where you'll understand where we exactly get about and how do we identify these effective interest rates yes guys so let's continue with understanding what is effective interest rate very important concept under India is 23 now this word effective interest rate has been defined or has been measured as per India's 109 there are multiple places which uses the word effective interest rate but all the standards refer only to the word effective interest rate but this word effective interest rate has been defined and has been measured as per India's 109 now what does this effective interest rate actually talk about Effective interest rate actually includes any processing charges which are incidental to the loan. What are the processing charges? Normally when I apply 100 rupees of a loan, 100 rupees does not get credit into my bank account. What you get a credit is 100 rupees and immediately there is a 2 rupees of a debit saying that it is bank charges. These are called as processing charges. What are those processing charges actually? Because when I have to register a mortgage of the property which I have given as a collateral, such property mortgage always has something called as registration of charges. You have to pay MCA fees. You have to pay stamp duty on that. All such incidental charges put together, the bank charges one consolidated amount called as processing charges. Along with that, chartered accountant facilitates the person who, who wants to seek a loan to make sure that the documentation is proper for whatever is being submitted to the bank. Now, we are not going to do any charity out there. We'll also be getting some amount of amount of remuneration from the from the customer for processing the loan. All such amounts can be called as processing charges. They are incidental to the borrower. Sometimes you can have discount on issue or premium on redemption of debentures and bonds. Premium on redemption on debentures and bonds debentures and bonds are also long-term sources of finance so even they will be considered as a borrowing and all those discounts on issue or premium on redemption if any will also be considered as an amount which is incidental will also be included under the computation of effective interest rate what exactly is the effective interest rate and how do I calculate that? Like I said, EIR is simply equal to the IRR. When the present value of cash flows arising from borrowing are equated to zero. This is the place where we get the actual effective interest rate. For example, let's take an illustrative understanding of this. Let's say, for example, I have a loan. And let's say this bank loan was about a lakh rupee. And this, let's say, had to be paid in five equal installments. along with interest such interest is charged at the rate of let's say 10 percent per annum when i have a situation like this let me give you the understanding of it let's say the processing charges of this case certain processing charges i will deduct and i'll say that let's say the processing charges were about four thousand Now look at the cash flows now. The cash flows being generated can be given like this. Year 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now during these years, if I understand the cash flows, 
should go something like this. First, I got a positive cash flow, cash inflow of 96,000. How did I get 96? I have applied for a 1 lakh rupee loan. I did 4,000 rupees of processing charges got deducted. My net cash flow is only 96,000. Now, think about the first year. First year, I'm supposed to calculate the interest on this particular 1 lakh. 1 lakh at the rate of 10%, not 96,000. I'll charge the interest on the principal amount that is 1 lakh. 1 lakh into 10% is 10,000. You're paying in five equal installments. That means each installment itself is 20,000 for principal. So I'm paying 20,000 towards principal, compulsory every year. Along with that, I'm also paying the amount of interest in the first case is about 10,000. So I'm having a negative cash flow of 30,000 in the first year. Now my loan outstanding at the end of first year has come down to 80,000 because I have done 20,000 of principal repayment. That 80,000, I'll again charge 10% interest for the second year, which becomes 8,000. Principal repayment is constant 20,000. So my cash outflow becomes 28. Like this, it becomes 26 in third year. It becomes 24 in fourth year. And finally, 22 in fifth year. I'll have to make sure that I apply some discount factors at a whatever percentage it is for n number of years and I have to multiply and I'll get the discounted cash flows. All you have to do is make sure that your discounted cash flows are zero at a particular rate and this rate which I've applied here is called as a IRR or in our case we are calling it as effective interest rate. Understand though the interest is 10% by solving the equation like this, the percentage that you're going to get, your EIR is definitely being more than 10%. In this case, I think you'll land up to about 10.7 or percent of whatever it is, 10 to 11% in between, you will be landing out. Now that is because of the processing charges which were included. Had I taken 1 lakh here and discounted the cash flows, I would have got exactly 1 lakh. Now this is how we are trying to understand what an effective interest rate is. Now this effective interest rate has to be incorporated as far as your India S23 is concerned because it is not the 10% which we are going to consider as borrowing cost. We are considering 10.7 as a borrowing cost. Now by considering 10.7 what we are trying to do is this 4000 rupees which were charged initially as processing charges I am not considering it, considering it as an expense in one year itself. We are considering it as an expense over the period of the borrowing being repaid. So this is the primary understanding of why we actually apply this rate called as effective interest rate. Got it? Had this effective interest rate concept not been there, then this processing charges would have been amortized to PNL or sometimes directly charged to PNL. So to harmonize the effect or charge to PNL, we are trying to identify something called as effective interest rate. Clear? So yes, guys. Let's see what this exchange differences have to do with India's 23. Exchange differences actually dealt as per India's 23 to an extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. What is this concept all about? And why am I treating an exchange difference which is as per India's 23 as borrowing cost as per India's 20, uh, sorry, exchange differences as per India's 21. Why am I treating it as per borrowing cost as per India's 23? There should be some logic in understanding why is this actually happening? Let me explain with the help of an example. Let's say for suppose, I required a borrowing of let's say in rupee I want a borrowing of about 5 lakhs. This is a borrowing which is required. I started assessing it and I understood that the interest rate in India was about 10% per annum let's say. Well, I started assessing what could be the rate if I would have borrowed in dollars. Then I said I can't borrow $50,000 
I have to apply exchange rate. Let's say for the purpose of ease, let's say dollar rate was 50. How many borrowers you should have, how many dollars you should have borrowed? To make it 5, 5 lakhs, I need to borrow $10,000. If I borrow $10,000, I'll convert it at 50 rupees per dollar, I'll get back to my 5 lakhs. Had I borrowed in dollars, I would have actually got the borrowing only at, let's say, 5%. Now understand, think from a businessman's perspective. Why should I pay 10,000 rupees per annum, 10% per annum, when I can actually get the borrowing at 5% per annum? He started assessing the interest impact. Interest at the end of year, if I calculate, here I was supposed to pay about 50,000 rupees. Well, here I was supposed to pay only $500. Let's say exchange rate at the end of the year was about 55. Uh, what I'll do, I have to pay $500 at 55 rupees. Considering this, my rupee equivalent amount will be 27,500. I would still say it is beneficial though the dollar rate has increased because had I borrowed in rupee, I would have paid 50,000. Now I am paying only 27,000. Comparing these two terms, I can identify that there is a savings in interest. My savings in interest is about 22,500. Now let's understand what is happening here. This situation what has come up right now, we'll have to assess it with respect to India S21 that is exchange differences. According to India S21, the dollar borrowing is a monetary item. So you have to compulsory restate monetary items at closing rate. And this is given as per India S21 exchange differences. So I am supposed to restate the monetary items at closing rate using India S21 with which I am understanding that there is an increase in the dollar. Dollar rate increase, what will you repay? I am not supposed to repay in rupee. I am supposed to repay dollar. How many dollars you will repay? $10,000 I have to repay. But for me to repay $10,000, today I have to buy each dollar at 55 rupees. But when I actually bought the loan or when I took the borrowing, it was only 50. So that earlier I would have recorded the borrowing as 5 lakhs. But now I'm saying I have to repay $10,000 buying each dollar at 55 rupees. That means I have to spend 5 lakh 50,000 rupees to basically repay the borrowing. Borrowing has increased in value as far as your rupee terms is concerned. Though in dollar certain terms it is 10,000, in rupee terms it has increased from 5 lakh to 5 lakh 50. Reason being your exchange rate. These are called as exchange losses. Exchange loss on FC means foreign currency. On foreign currency borrowing should be calculated this way. $10,000 into 55 minus 50 rupees per dollar. You would be getting about 50,000 rupees. What we are trying to say here is this 50,000 rupees is an exchange loss as per India S21 which should be treated as per that respective standard. But I am trying to say that out of this 50,000 exchange differences to an extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. What is this extent? Now let's see what he is saying. Borrowing cost is lower of number one savings in interest or exchange loss on foreign currency borrowing look at them on now Savings and interest is 
22,500. While exchange loss on foreign currency borrowing is 50,000 rupees. Which is lower out here? 22,500 is lower. This should be treated as borrowing cost. So what we are saying, out of the exchange loss that we have suffered, we are saying that I'll split this into two types. To an extent of 22,500 rupees, this should be treated as borrowing cost under India's 23. While to an extent of the balance amount that is 27,500, I will treat it as exchange loss as per India's 21. This is what we understand as far as exchange losses are concerned, to an extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. So in this case, what we are trying to say is the exchange loss on borrowing to an extent can be regarded as borrowing cost. To what extent? To the extent of lower of the savings and interest or the entire amount of exchange loss. If your savings and interest is lower, then a portion of the, the balance portion should be treated as per India's 21. India's 23 is not talking about that. This is a practical understanding of how the situation actually appears. Now understand whatever he has done is absolutely logical. Think about it. I have borrowed in dollars just because the interest rate was lower. Understand by making a borrowing in dollars, I have assumed some risk. What risk? The currency risk. The exchange rate risk is what I have already assumed. Such exchange rate risk during the year has resulted in a loss of 50,000. Now, why did you take that exchange risk? You should have actually borrowed in dollars. Then he's saying, sir, I took that exchange risk because I was getting a savings as far as interest cost is concerned. Since I was trying to save the interest cost and then I have taken the exchange rate risk, the exchange rate risk has resulted in a loss. Why did you incur that loss? because i wanted to reduce my interest how much interest did you reduce i reduced only 22500 interest how much did you incur as exchange loss 50000 so he's saying to the extent of the 22500 which you avoided by borrowing in dollars instead of borrowing in rupee to that extent i will still treat it as borrowing cost the balance amount i am not going to talk about that let india's 21 deal with that clear this is the underlying concept and the logical treatment which is supposed to be given as per India's 23. That is borrowing cost. Clear? Now we have to understand what will happen if subsequently there is an exchange gain. Now here 50 to 55 there is an increase in dollar. There could always be an amount of decrease in the dollar rate at some years. Initially there was a loss, no problem. You have, you have treated it as borrowing cost. But sometimes, let's say, for suppose, in the subsequent year, the dollar has come down to 53. Then there's a 2 rupees of saving. Then to that extent of 2 rupees, what are we supposed to do? Let us see what we'll do with that. So yes, guys, let's try to understand what if there is a subsequent exchange gain on foreign currency borrowing. If there is a subsequent exchange gain on foreign currency borrowing, then we say that to an extent it was treated as borrowing cost should be dealt as per India's 23. That means to an extent of this 22,500 which you earlier recognized as borrowing cost, to that extent I will treat it as per India's 23. The balance exchange gain will be treated as per 
India is 21. Let's see what we are trying to talk about here and what does this even mean? First, suppose, for example, let's say the dollar in the subsequent year, subsequent year, the exchange rate has come down to about 53 rupees per dollar. I earlier recognized at 55. Now I'm recognizing at 53. So what is happening? I have saved or I have actually got a gain of 2 rupees per dollar. My liability which was 5,50,000 last time has now come down to only 5,30,000 giving me a 20,000 rupees of gain. So my exchange gain will be 20,000. How much did you earlier treat as borrowing cost? 22,500. How much did you get exchange gain now? 20,000. To an extent it was treated as per India's 23. It will continue to be treated as per India's 23. So here the entire amount should be dealt only as per India's 23 because it has not exceeded this amount 22,500. That is why we are saying that though it is an exchange gain, I will still continue to treat it as per India's 23 itself. However, if the exchange rate falls even further to 52 rupees per dollar, then in such case, identify the exchange gain then. Exchange gain this time will be 30,000, saving of 3 rupees per dollar. Out of this 30,000, how much was earlier treated as per, as per India's 23? 22,500. So, rupee 22,500 will be treated as per India's 23. There is still a balance left out. How much? 7,500 rupees of gain. This will be treated as per India's 21. This is regarding the subsequent exchange gain which will be realized, recognized on foreign currency borrowing. So, what are we trying to say? To an extent, you have treated the exchange loss as borrowing cost under India S21. To such extent, if there is a subsequent exchange gain which is recognized, I will treat it as per India S23 itself. After that, any balance if any, I will treat it as per India S21 as exchange gain. So this is what we understand as per the exchange losses to an extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. Yes, guys. So the primary thing which India is 23 will talk about is the treatment of borrowing cost or the recognition of borrowing cost. Till now, what we have discussed either as per effective interest rate or exchange rates or exchange losses to the extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost was entirely the ambit of definition of borrowing cost. We still haven't seen what is the accounting treatment or what is the recognition of borrowing cost. And that is the crux of the entire standard India is 23 talking about. What does India is 23 deal with? India is 23 says the borrowing cost on a qualifying asset is eligible to be capitalized while other borrowing cost should be simply charged to PNL. This is what the standard actually prescribes understand the terms which are we which are being used out here we are saying the amount to which it extend which pertain yes guys so every standard has a particular purpose when i said india's 23 talks about borrowing costs should have an inbuilt purpose now what is the purpose for which india's 23 has been issued when we are talking about borrowing cost borrowing cost is a simple expenditure and such expenditure normally being charged off to PNL. 
then why do I need a separate standard to discuss about it? Simply charge it off to pay and that is it. Close the issue. But that is not exactly what India S23 is talking about. What India S23 talks about is about the recognition of such borrowing cost. My recognition of borrowing cost has been mentioned under India's 23 specifically and there is a peculiar treatment that he has prescribed under the standard. What is the peculiar treatment? He says such tree recognition of borrowing cost should be split into two parts. There are two types. Borrowing cost incurred on qualifying asset. We will discuss what this qualifying asset is and other borrowing costs borrowing cost incurred on a qualifying asset is eligible to be capitalized while the other borrowing cost any other borrowing cost is charged to PNL now this is what we can talk about recognition of borrowing cost I'm saying a borrowing cost if it pertains to an asset called as qualifying asset out here we are supposed to capitalize such cost and if it is any other treatment then we will have to charge it off to PNL so capitalization and PNL PNL is a regular treatment. I don't have to even discuss further if the amount is being charged to PN. But since I'm capitalizing it, I'll have to discuss further about what this qualifying asset is, what is the amount that is eligible to be qualified, when to qualify, when to capitalize, and when not to capitalize. All these concepts have to be discussed in depth. Let's start with understanding what a qualifying asset is. qualifying asset to define this qualifying asset we simply say that this is an asset which necessarily takes a substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use or sale. There are certain things which we have to understand very carefully in the standard. The definition is talking about an asset which necessarily takes substantial period what is this substantial period? Question number one. Asset ready for its intended use or intended sale. What type of assets am I talking about here? When I say an asset is held for use, that means I'm talking about property, plan and equipment. Or even the intangible assets. use when i'm saying sale i'm referring to something called as inventory now if we look at inventory per se i'm saying that an asset can be an inventory which qualifies for the definition of qualifying asset and then if it satisfies the definition of qualifying asset you are saying that the cost borrowing cost is eligible to be capitalized however there's a conflict which arises between India 2 and India 23. What is the conflict that we are referring to here? The conflict that we are referring to here is with respect to the borrowing cost. India 2 has specifically excludes interest and other finance charges while including the word sale 
इंडेस 23 ऑन द अदर हैंड सेज दैट इफ द इन्वेंट्री सेटिस्फाइज डेफिनेशन ऑफ क्वालिफाइंग एसेट बोरिंग कॉस्ट शुड बी कैपिटलाइज और इज एलिजिबल टू बी कैपिटलाइज टू वेरी कॉन्फ्लिक्टिंग व्यूज कमिंग अप हियर गाइस आई एम डिस्कसिंग अबाउट टू कॉन्फ्लिक्टिंग व्यूज बिटवीन द स्टैंडर्ड वेर वन सच स्टैंडर्ड इज टॉकिंग अबाउट एक्सक्लूडिंग द इंटरेस्ट एंड फाइनेंस चार्जेस while the other one is asking me to capitalize the amount of borrowing cost if the definition of qualifying asset is satisfied now you can't comply with both the standards in a given situation because one standard is saying the cost should not include it the other standard is saying that it has to be capitalized now since i cannot comply with the standard there should always be a stand saying that one standard prevails over the other now which standard should be prevailing over the other that question comes up i will say that this is a general standard this is a general standard because it applies to all inventory but this i am talking about is a specific standard why is it specific i am not talking about every type of inventory i am talking about only such inventory which satisfies the definition of qualifying asset if it satisfies the definition of qualifying asset then i will call it as Okay, I'll then I will make sure that I'm complying with India's twenty-three. Therefore, I can say that India's twenty-three prevails over AS two. Or India's two. This is what we can derive from the conflicting. paragraphs of each such standard now this is regarding use or sale we have to understand something called as substantial period of time very important word guys substantial period what does this word substantial period even stand for and how is it significant in explaining what is a qualifying asset now let's see When I say substantial, what do you understand in a general knowledge? General sense, substantial period means much longer than a normal period. Now, this much longer than a normal period is very dangerous because it allows enough scope of interpreting in multiple ways. For example, let's say very relatable example I'll take for a student who is who is actually pursuing the course of chartered accountancy, six months is a substantial period. For me, the life changes every six months. the people around me change every 6 months the circumstances around me change every 6 months but for an engineering student of the same age such course, such particular person we normally say that 4 years is a substantial period because during the 4 years period whenever he wants to clear the course he can clear the course ultimately he'll get the certificate so that means two different courses two different professional courses which are being pursued by two people of the same age allows for different type of evaluation or interpretation for this word substantial period so enough scope is there or enough subjective definition can be given as far as sub the substantial period is concerned so we will have to come up and give a much more consolidated definition saying that this exactly is what i mean by substantial period if i leave enough scope for people to start interpreting it unfortunate thing is each one will have their own set of standards but understand accounting standards per se have been given to make sure that people are following uniform set of standards why do you need uniform set of standards so that you have financial statements on comparable basis but if i allow such interpretations to happen in multiple ways then the comparability is normally question that is the reason why we'll have to figure out something to be fixed for the substantial period substantial period i would say i would start by saying that it is not explained 
in India is 23. Doesn't mean I leave it like that. I will give an appropriate explanation for that. But however, even the preceding standard, if I talk about that is A16, the previous generation standards of IGAP, A16 corresponding standard is India S23, that is borrowing cost. We did not have an explanation for substantial period. However, then came in the concept of accounting standard interpretation 1. This accounting standard interpretation 1 at that point of time said that substantial period should be a period which is greater than 12 months. Accounting standard interpretation said that it is a period which is exceeding 12 months. It can be considered as substantial period. However, he said that this term is a rebuttable assumption. What do you mean by this term? Rebuttable assumption. Now this term rebuttable assumption has been used multiple terms times in the standard. So we'll have to understand what this rebuttable assumption actually stands for. When I use the word rebuttable assumption, what I meant by saying is a period shorter than 12 months can also be considered as substantial period if sufficient facts of case are provided understand what he's saying now He's saying that it is a rebuttable assumption. By the word rebuttable assumption, what we understand is that you can contradict the assumption. I can make sure that I'm using a period which is much shorter than 12 months also a substantial period. But for me to take such stand, I'll have to provide sufficient facts of the case. So rebuttable assumption means there are assumptions taken by the standard by and large, which can apply to most of the cases. But however, if I have sufficient facts of the case which can make me believe that a period much shorter than 12 months can be considered a substantial period, I would consider such period a substantial period instead of the, taking this period of 12 months. Instead of taking this 12 months, I can take much shorter period. This is what we can understand by this word substantial period. So I'm saying an asset which necessarily takes substantial period to get ready for its use or sale will be called as a qualifying asset. And if I have a qualifying asset, then the borrowing cost attributed to that is eligible to be capitalized. This is the crux of the standard. If someone will ask me what was AS23 talking about, I will say that it talks about capitalization of borrowing cost on qualifying asset. In essence, this is what we talk about. We are saying India AS23 talks about capitalization of borrowing cost on a qualifying asset. So this is what a qualifying asset is how we define it now we'll have to look at how to capitalize how much amount to capitalize how to quantify it now all such things we have to start looking at but this is the understanding of the basic core concept of what the standard is so like we have seen the essence of the standard is basically to help us understand what is the concept of qualifying asset and the India S23 always emphasizes on capitalization of borrowing cost on qualifying asset. Now, we have identified what is a qualifying asset. Now, what we understand is how to measure the amount to be capitalized. When I say borrowing cost is eligible to be capitalized, then how much? What is it which is eligible to be capitalized? Borrowing cost... eligible to be capitalized what is the amount of borrowing cost which is eligible to be capitalized 
when i talk about borrowing cost eligibility to capitalize the first thing that will enter into my head is first thing how many types of borrowings are there whether i have a specific treatment for each kind of borrowing yes we have whenever we are talking about borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized the first thing that you have to understand that my borrowings for this purpose are split into two types one is called a specific borrowing other one is known as non specific or you can call them as general borrowing what does each one stand for or how do i define what is specific and what is non specific specific borrowing what do you understand by that the first look of it will explain you that this borrowing is specifically taken for the qualifying asset as simple as that this borrowing is taken for this qualifying asset but unfortunately the standard does not give such easy definitions they'll always make sure that you are turning around the situations and they're trying to produce a definition which will confuse all the rest except the chartered accountants so that's why we came out with a very interesting definition what we say is i would have avoided this borrowing had i not taken the construction of that qualifying asset i would have avoided this borrowing had i not taken the construction of that qualifying asset ultimately what are you trying to say you are trying to say that that borrowing was taken only for that particular purpose and nothing else so that is what specific borrowing is all about when i talk about specific borrowing what we indicate here is a borrowing which would have been avoided if the construction of qualifying asset was not taken up while non specific borrowing so lengthy definition is not given in simple terms he says it is other than specific borrowing that's it now we have to understand we have only classified the borrowings as specific and non specific we did not talk about what is a borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized that was our heading what are we saying there are two types of borrowing if i have one qualifying asset let's say building this building has to be constructed it is a qualifying asset because it took substantial period of time that means the period is beyond 12 months then in such case for the construction of that building i have gone to idba bank acquired a loan and that loan has been utilized only for the purpose of that construction however the enterprise already had an existing borrowing which to an extent have been used for other purpose and to an extent has also been used on the qualifying asset so that idb a loan will be called a specific borrowing the loan which was already existing is called as non specific borrowing how do i identify the borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized this is what we are talking about borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized is equal to the actual borrowing cost on specific borrowings reduced by less return on ideal funds actual borrowing cost reduced by the amount of return on ideal funds this is the amount of borrowing cost which is eligible to be capitalized understand guys ideal funds means let's say for example 
If I have acquired a borrowing of 100 crores from IDBI Bank today for the construction of a particular building, which is a qualifying asset per se, the entire 100 crores is not consumed on one single day. I will consume that 100 crores over the period of time. But the bank has disbursed the money at one stretch. Since it is a specific borrowing, I cannot use it for any other purpose except for the construction of the qualifying asset. So what I have to do? I need only 20 crores of fund for three years, for at least the first three months. I don't need the entire 100 crores. What do we do? The balance 80 crores, we start investing elsewhere so that we make some return out of that idle fund. Such amount of return that you have made out of idle fund has to be deducted from the amount of borrowing cost and only the residual amount is eligible to be capitalized. That means, let's say, for example, I add 100 crores of borrowing, it carries 12% rate of interest. Now that 100 crores of borrowing, 12% rate of interest during the entire year came out to about 12 crores. Out of which, 80 crores were idle fund throughout the year. Such 80 crores I invested elsewhere at 8% return. How much amount of interest did I gain? I got a return of 6.4 crores. On that 80 crores, I got a return of 6.4 crores. How much did I pay? 12. How much did I get a return? 6.4. How much is it eligible to be capitalized? The difference that is 5.6, 12 minus 6.4. That is what he's talking about in specific borrowing. But when we are talking about non-specific borrowing, we have to understand that borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized can be given as borrowing utilized you did not take the entire borrowing only for this purpose so utilization of the borrowing should be considered multiplied by something called as capitalization rate multiplied by something called as capitalization rate then what exactly is this capitalization rate amount of borrowing utilized let's say the non-specific borrowing was 100 crores I've used it for plenty of purposes including the purpose for the construction of a building which was a qualifying asset. I invested only 25 crores out of the non-specific borrowing in that. How can I apply this formula actual borrowing cost? Because the actual borrowing cost was the entire borrowing. Only to the extent I have utilized I have to capitalize. So that's why only to the extent you have utilized multiplied by capitalization rate. What exactly is this capitalization rate? Capitalization rate is nothing but a weighted average rate on borrowings or non-specific borrowing a weighted average rate on non-specific borrowing can be considered as capitalization rate what is this weighted average rate how do I identify the formula of this weighted average? The formula can be given like this. Capitalization rate is equal to total borrowing cost on non-specific borrowing or general borrowing, you can name it. Divided by total non-specific borrowings. This is the formula for my capitalization rate to be applied. Remember guys, this formula will hold good only if an enterprise has multiple non-specific borrowing. If the enterprise has only one non-specific borrowing, what is weighted average rate then? Weighted average rate will be the rate of that particular borrowing. Here I am only talking about, okay, multiplied by 100 because I am talking about rate. Yeah, now here I am talking about 
the case where if I have multiple kinds of borrowing cost or multiple non-specific borrowing, how will I identify the capitalization rate or weighted average rate can be indicated this way. Got it? So this will conclude the concept of borrowing cost which is eligible to be capitalized. We have divided them into specific and non-specific borrowing and each such borrowing has a different way of recognition or a different way of measuring the amount of borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized. Now, we will discuss about another small concept out here where we say that borrowing cost should not be capitalized. I'm talking about exceptions now. If I will not capitalize the borrowing cost if asset is initially recognized at fair value. Asset is initially recognized at its fair value. Guys, initially recognized at fair value. If you capitalize the borrowing cost, what will happen? The cost of the asset will be fair value plus borrowing cost. That means you are inflating the asset beyond its fair value, which is not possible. So we will have to ensure that I am restricting it to the fair value. So asset should be only if it is initially recognized at fair value, then further capitalization of borrowing cost should not apply. Number one. Number two. For inventory manufactured on repeated basis you cannot apply the standard I'll tell you why I did not apply the standard there if the inventory is measured on repeated basis the word which is being used out here now small quantities multiple times so what is happening you cannot identify what is substantial period of time because if someone will ask you let's say I have given an order for 10,000 units per day it is possible for an enterprise to only produce 25 units then what will happen to get 10,000 units out then the manufacturing entity has to spend 10,000 divided by 24 that is almost 400 days 400 days is beyond one accounting period then you will say it is substantial period of time which is not so because it is an inventory which is manufactured on a repeated basis and it's a large quantity that's why it might look like a substantial period but it is not so very very interesting concept guys because it will always lead to a misconception that if I get a big order then it will become a substantial period of time which is absolutely wrong you will have to understand that if you are doing an inventory manufacture, such inventory, if it is done on a repeated basis, just because the quantity is large and it takes a substantial period of time, you cannot construe it as a substantial period. You cannot continue to, con uh, to capitalize the borrowing cost. You cannot conclude that those inventories will classify or will satisfy the definition of qualifying asset. This is what we are talking about two exception rules which we can talk about I will name this if you want I'll name this as exceptions to capitalization of borrowing cost these are exceptions for capitalization of borrowing cost now this is what we can talk about and nothing else in the standard as far as this part is concerned we have other concepts of the standard as well which we'll have to discuss that is when to start and when to stop capitalization we have to start and stop capitalization at a particular periods and what is those conditions to be satisfied to start or stop capitalization process let us understand that yes guys in substance we have to discuss about three concepts now The first one being commencement of capitalization. I mean to say, when should I start capitalization process? 
when should I start this process of capitalizing the cost? Capitalization of borrowing cost should commence at a particular point of time. Let's say for suppose, if the construction of a qualifying asset commenced on 1st April, initially I have invested my own money into the project. However, I have taken the borrowing on 1st of October. So what happens? I started incurring borrowing cost only after 1st October. But the qualifying asset started on 1st of April. The period between 1st April to 1st October, am I eligible to capitalize the borrowing cost? Answer is no. Reason? There is no borrowing cost at all. There was a qualifying asset, but where is the borrowing cost for you to capitalize? You have taken only the borrowing on 1st of October, so your capitalization could only commence on 1st of October itself. Number two. I've taken the borrowing on 1st April, but the process of constructing a qualifying asset only commenced on 1st July. Three months was a period for which I did not take up any process of construction. So what is happening now? For the three months period, did I incur the bo qualifier, your borrowing cost on, the quali on that particular borrowing? Yes, I did. I have to continue to pay interest. I cannot go and tell the banker, boss, I did not start the construction, so I will not pay the borrowing cost. That is not possible. The banker will say whether you have commenced the project or not, whether you have utilized the fund or not, I have given you the money, you have to pay the interest, that's it. So this period of three months from 1st April to 1st July, I have incurred a borrowing cost, but the qualifying asset started construction only on 1st July. Is it eligible to be capitalized the first three months? Absolutely no. Because though you have incurred the borrowing cost on, the, on that particular borrowing, you could, did not start the commencement of qualifying asset. Without having a qualifying asset, where will I capitalize the amount of borrowing cost? So this way we have to understand that both of them together exist. So we have to say that commencement of borrowing cost should be started only when all the following conditions are being satisfied. when the following conditions are satisfied what are the conditions which I am talking about number one capitalization should commence when the borrowing cost is incurred. Number two, expenditure on qualifying asset is incurred. Number three, activities necessary for construction of qualifying asset are in progress. These are the three conditions which are necessary to be satisfied for me to commence the capitalization process. Now what are these activities necessary? Activities necessary for construction of qualifying asset are in progress. I paid advance to a supplier. Just because you paid advance doesn't mean that the, uh, the qualifying asset has commenced. Supplier has supplied the goods to me doesn't mean that the qualifying asset is already in progress. Such goods are applied in the construction process. Yes, that is a date when I can say that the activity on the qualifying asset is in progress and that is when you can start commencing the capitalization process. All the three conditions are being separated by the word and so it necessarily requires all the three conditions to be satisfied for me to commence the capitalization on a qualifying asset. Now when I say activities, it can include 
designing planning staffing etc where the activity is not physically visible it is not physically visible for you to do the process but it is still an integral part of constructing a qualifying asset so we can say that compulsory you have to commence capitalization even though it is on a designing planning staffing or any other phase at the initial operation the second thing which i'm start looking at now this will be an interesting concept the second one which i want to talk about is called as cessation what is cessation mean cessation cease cease means stop so when to stop capitalization when to stop capitalization has been interestingly given like this send the construction of the the capitalization of borrowing cost on a qualifying asset should cease when the asset is ready for its intended use or say i'm saying you stop capitalization once the qualifying asset is ready for its intended use or say what basically happens in this case let's say i have constructed a building this building was with an intention to lease it out to someone else majority of the building is substantially completed but i did not find a person who can take it on lease i'm still eagerly waiting for a customer if i stop capitalization now then what happens the borrowing cost will start hitting my pnl allow it keep on charging to pnl if it kept on charging to pnl ultimately my prof my profits will not be visible it will completely go into losses because i do not have a lease income at all so if i have a customer i don't mind charging the borrowing cost to pnl so what very cleverly this uh, you know person has done this enterprise has done is they made sure that they did not complete the process every day they came every day they would fit one window they go back every day they put fit one door they go back they are not intending to complete the work they are trying to prolong the work as much as possible because i am already incurring borrowing cost anyways i i don't have to do anything the construction cost is already done or i don't have to do anything if i complete the process then you will say that the borrowing cost should cease to capitalize then the entire amount should be charged to pay and i kept on doing like that for a month or two then i found a customer rest of the entire doors and windows were fit within a week time and it was handed over and i said i'm stopping capitalization this means i'm trying to make undue advantage of wordings used in the standard now it's a ici which has drafted it so it will leave a very little scope for anything as such so let's understand what it says cessation means capitalization of borrowing cost should cease when the qualifying asset is substantially ready observe the words being used for its intended use or say he did not use the word ready instead he used the word substantially ready substantially ready means it is not complete so that means i am saying you need not complete it if it is completed in majority of the content that will be the seizure of your capitalization you cannot continue capitalization of borrowing cost at all this is what we talk about in cessation when you have to stop but an interesting concept has to be discussed here that is suspension
what is suspension and what is the difference in cessation suspension means temporarily i'm stopping it cessation means permanent stoppage i will not continue to use it by any chance again so suspension and cessation are slightly different suspension is temporary break suspension is complete stop so when we talk about suspension why does the suspension actually happen we are saying that capitalization should be suspended if active development of qualifying asset active development of qualifying asset is interrupted for an extended period of time i'll have two things to emphasize on active development second one extended period of time let's understand this extended period of time let's say for suppose i did not use this word i just said capitalization of borrowing cost should be suspended when active development of a qualifying asset is interrupted if i were to stop there let's say this enterprise is a five day week so saturday and sunday it is off there is no construction on qualifying asset which is going on 52 weeks two weekly days per week 104 days gandhi jayanti you know independence day that jayanti this jayanti ultimately put together another 22 30 days so about 120 days out of 365 days i haven't done any active development of the asset so that means to the extent of this 120 days the amount of borrowing cost should be charged to pnl had this words not been used what am i using here beyond a normal period extended period of time extended period means beyond normal period if the period for which you have uh, your active development is interrupted is for an extended period that is beyond normal and normally occurs in the case of extraordinary situations it's a not regular situation like a weekend coming up or dasara holidays or sankranti holidays or pongal holidays which come up we are saying that it should be extraordinary situation it is beyond the normal situation then in such case only i will suspend there is a strike there is a lockout the enterprise is out of funds the management is in a turmoil they are not able to continue the process for a temporary period such cases i will put it under suspension of capitalization and remember the period for which it the interruption happens should be an extended period which means it is much more than a normal interruption which could happen active development the reason why i highlighted the word active development is because very interesting situation actually arises here sometimes there are certain assets there are certain assets where it is necessary to be interrupted it is necessary to stop the process for a period of time and start commencing all over again like a farmer normally after each crop he just plows the land and just leaves it like that because the fertility of the land or the the solidity of the land normally gets frizzled out after each crop so i have to leave it for a particular period of time if i don't do that my next crop is going to get affected that is what i'm saying so my interruption was very much necessary in completing the qualifying asset had that interruption not been there the qualifying asset wouldn't have been complete even the constructions of buildings also for a temporary period you do you can't keep construction constructing each every day you construct you stop it you start doing a process called as curing curing means water is being you know poured on all these walls and everything so that they solidify and then you again start commencing the capital the, your construction so such period of interruption in active development is necessary 
without that i cannot complete the essay in such cases even though there is an interruption you can continue to capitalize because it was necessary for the construction of capitalization for the construction of qualifying asset it was necessary to do that interruption so such interruptions will not amount to suspension you will continue to capitalize the borrowing cost even during such interrupted period if such an interruption is necessary for the construction of qualifying asset this in a broad sense is what india's 23 is talking about regarding your capitalization of borrowing cost on qualifying assets